coming up, Professor Robert Patman. Now, uh, Otago University, very smart man, uh, very widely accredited as a, um, a pretty good observer, a pretty sage observer of the international scene. Um, I promised you this at the start of the show. I said to you, we need to find out what the two big international events are at the moment and what relevance they are to us, really. Um, the first is the midterm elections. You would have um, seen a fair bit of coverage about that. They're still ongoing. Gosh, it doesn't look like it's going to be solved anytime soon. And COP27 in Egypt, which seems to be breaking up in some discord, and some of the larger players aren't even there. Joining us to talk about these things, and thank you for waiting. Really appreciate it. Professor Robert Patman, good morning to you. Good morning, Michael. How are you? I'm very well. Um, listen, mate, good. first thing, um, let's go to the midterms first. Uh, I have to say I've, I'm fascinated in politics, so are you, so you're, you've probably got so, yeah, live, sure. yeah, we've got the live election results and everything and we're sitting there, but when are we going to know what the final result is? <laughs> uh, imminently, I think, is the phrase being used. Um, uh, it, 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 to, certainly, uh, the race for the Senate is on a knife edge and it looks like the Republicans have won overall control of the House of Representatives, but those results haven't yet been confirmed. But it's turning out to be um, President Biden has probably got the best, has appeared to score the best midterm result of any president in the last 20 years, which is, you know, which <laughs> is ironic, isn't surprising. It? Yes, that's right. Well, it, it is given the fact that um, many commentators, both within the United States and elsewhere, thought there would be a huge red wave and uh, the, you know, the, he would suffer the fate that President Obama suffered in 2010 and, and President Clinton suffered in uh, 1994 when the, the Republicans um, basically stormed through and took control of both houses of Congress. Mm. Um, all right. And the Senate, of course, we know is locked and I think, gosh, they're talking about it going down to the wire again, weeks away from a result. There's a runoff somewhere. Is that Georgia? Yeah, the, yeah, Georgia is a runoff that because neither candidate got to the magical 50%, and under the rules, there has to be a runoff. Nevada and Arizona are both on a knife edge, very little separating the candidates. Um, New York, the New York Times has called it for the Democrat in Nevada, but it's very close. Um, the thing that surprised me about that is those three states, I think, voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump at the last election, didn't they? So, mm. how come... Yeah, that, that, that's... Well, the interesting thing about these midterms, uh, Michael, is that it hasn't really gone well for Donald Trump. And he had a lot of candidates that he lent a, you know, a lot of support to. Um, these were people who believed, like him, that the election had been stolen, and a lot of them lost. And the other thing is, um, he's, they targeted uh, the Attorney General of New York, who got re-elected, who's carrying out an investigation into Mr. Trump. Um, and that's a serious investigation. So it looks like Mr. Trump, this, this, this midterms has certainly not alleviated some of the legal problems that will face him, which has big implications. Is it However, the but, but, but is there also the potential here, Professor, that that Donald yep. Trump's hurt the Republicans, that the Republicans could have swept the Senate and the House of Representatives, well, but I for think his that's involvement. The message that, well, I think this, that, side, that, that angle is going to come to the fore because it's almost certain uh, that Mr. Trump will announce his candidature for the 2024 uh, presidential election in Florida, um, in, in the not too distant future, some people are saying the fifteenth of November. Now, if that's the case, that will put him. He's already in a in, in a sort of rivalry with uh, uh, De Santos, uh, who's done very well in in Florida, and who also wants to, the, ro the nomination for the Republican Party. So, we, I, I think, the midterms may have actually increased tensions within the Republican Party going forward. And uh, as you know, when you're in opposition, unity is is very important. Well, it's not been much unity. I've just read a BBC story here, um, <laughs> and you've probably read it as well. I should share it with our listeners, though. Um, sure. That uh, Donald Trump has uh, told US network Fox News that the Florida governor should stay out of the race. Uh, it's for the Republican nomination. And gone on to say that um, if he didn't... Um, 
uh, he would release unflattering information about the 44-year-old Florida governor. Uh, a clear threat. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that'll put the fear of death into the um, F- Florida governor uh, when he knows that Mr. Trump is about to be engulfed by further lawsuits. Uh, I, I, the other thing is that I think De Santos, the Florida governor, will probably take the view, which is widely shared with the... Well, I say widely. I think he's shared by at least some parts of the Republican Party that they can't afford to go into the 2024 election with their nominee uh, facing serious legal charges. And uh, that may well have a key bearing on who gets it. But, yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing the gloves coming off, yeah. Yeah, uh, already coming off, it appears. Okay, now, the question uh, that I wanted to ask you, and obviously um, I hope my producer asked you as well, what are the implications, if any of these midterm elections for New Zealand? Oh, I think they're significant. Um, both in a sort of bilateral level, relations between New Zealand and the uh, United States, which are actually pretty good at the moment. Uh, and I think they'll probably be consolidated and, if anything, deepen. Um, but also in a wider international uh, context, we've got this uh, terrible war going on in Ukraine following an illegal invasion by Russia of Ukraine. And New Zealand very much has a stake in Mr. Putin being defeated there, as does the United States. However, a number of Republicans, including uh, Marjorie Greene uh, Taylor, um, have indicated that should the Republicans um, seize control of both houses, they would seriously look at reducing support for Ukraine in its attempt to resist the invasion. That would not be in our interest because as a small country which trades with more than 100 100 countries, we very much depend on a pretty stable rules-based order. So if might is right, um, if if that message gets across and is accepted because Mr. Putin hangs on to his territorial gains in Ukraine via invasion, that is destabilizing for not just New Zealand, but a lot of small and middle-sized countries. And uh, we're not big enough to make our own rules, but we are globally involved. So, therefore, we do need rules to try and level the landscape out a bit. And so I think the fact that the Republicans, particularly the Trump wing, haven't done that well, um, not as well as expected anyway, is probably going to mean that Mr. Uh, Mr. Biden won't feel encumbered at all in pursuing the policy that he's doing towards Ukraine. No, I was, just, I was thinking that too. I've also looked back, um, I, I was trying to see how many Republicans voted for that support. There's still a good yeah. number of Republicans who actually support uh, Biden's policy on the Ukraine and giving support there. I think. Oh I'm, yeah, that's true. And I, 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 yeah, You're absolutely right. I wouldn't want to convey the view uh, that the majority of Republicans support the views of about 10 I think it's uh, been about 10 senators who've been saying that they want uh, America to quit its support for uh, you know, uh, defending uh, Euro- Ukraine. But it, it nevertheless could cause complications. Yeah, and, I, I understand. Um, but it's going, to cause, yeah. it's going to cause more complications, I would have thought, for the Republicans than for American foreign policy because, well, it's just another yeah. issue oh, that yeah. splits them, isn't it? It is, and also the president everybody across the political divide expects the president to be the face of American foreign policy. Yeah. And I don't think it would deflect President Biden, but it might make some of his allies and friends nervous about whether America really is united in its support for Ukraine. And it might also have secondary effects like weakening Europe's support for Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. If America seemed to be backing off, yeah. why should the Europeans uh, be, you know, not pulled solidly behind the effort. So I, I think overall, from a New Zealand perspective, uh, the result seems to be quite good in terms of relations with the United States and our wider interest in Ukraine and also the Pacific because we've been working in re- the last year, we've been working closely with the United States and the Australia, particularly since the new government that came to power in Australia in trying to counter what is seen as Chinese assertiveness in the Pacific region. Yes, and that's the corollary of this, isn't it? That although it's about the Ukraine and Russia and it's over there and really yep. not 
instantly relevant to us except in terms of $100 wages between producers and hosts. I've got a $100 wager with one of the producers that Russia right. won't win this war. Um, <laughs> the, um, which I think I'm pretty okay on, just quietly. Um, I think I think that's a good bet. Yes, yeah, so do I. Um, the other thing is, though, that um, it might embolden China, particularly re Taiwan, uh, if yeah. Europe was suddenly to go flaky and the United States too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There are a linkage between these events, mm. and uh, China was ambivalent initially about the U Putin's invasion, although there are signs now that it's backing away because it realised the scale of the, the military debacle for Russia. Oh, I think they've worked Ukraine. out that they're going to lose. I mean, if they were thinking about... Yeah, that's, that's precisely the yeah, point. And, yeah. and they said yesterday, under no circ... I mean, the Chinese leadership said quite categorically, under no circumstances would there be any justification for the use of nuclear weapons of any sort in Ukraine, which is really telling Putin... You're not, we're not going to be party to the idea that you can rescue yourself from the jaws of defeat by unleashing a nuclear tactical weapon in Ukraine. So, and I think the Chinese have a very good reading of the Russian military and also the FSB, which probably share that view. There's a lot of discontent in Russia about Putin's decision-making in relation to Ukraine, and they probably think we're not going to be involved in a nuclear war because Putin made a catastrophic misjudgment with respect to Ukraine. Now, taking um, talking about catastrophic misjudgments, the COP27 yep. is the conference of parties happening in Egypt, as you know. China's yep. not there. Russia's... Well, the Chinese leader isn't there. The Russian leader isn't there. Is Biden going? Um, I think he's... I think, I think my understanding is... And sorry, I didn't... Um, no, do right. my I just, homework I, on this. Yeah. Uh, I, my understanding is that certainly there'll be high level representation for the United States, um, but with the midterms, the timing's not great. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Um, um, but the um, other thing here yeah, is um, that rich nation. Uh, the, it's been a fascinating scrap. I'm looking at it through the lens of the New Zealand news media, so I know that sometimes that's not necessarily as accurate as it might be. You look through lens of different um, issues. It seems from this vantage that there's an unholy scrap happening in Egypt between the richer nations and the poorer nations as to whether or not the richer nations are kind of compensate the poorer nations for the effects of climate change, which the poorer nations blame on the richer nations. Have I got that right? Yes. I mean, essentially, countries which industrialised earlier, um, and particularly the superpowers, the US and China, um, have cumulatively contributed to the lion's share of the emissions which led to climate change. And so countries like our neighbours in Pacific Island states, which are bearing the brunt of the symptoms, I mean, after all, some of the micro-states in the Pacific Island region could well be facing the prospect that rising sea levels might make their islands, some of them, uninhabitable within 20 years but they've actually done nothing to create the problem. And so many developing states are saying, look, um, we want a global solution to this problem because it's, it's an ex it's essential threat to us. Uh, but, you know, we want you to assist us in trying to counter this problem. Well, can you because explain you this play... to me? Yeah, can you explain this to me, yeah, though, sorry. Professor? That's all right. No, I think it's my problem for interrupting you. But um, James Shaw, the climate change minister, has earmarked... <laughs> $20 million in funding for loss and damage, uh, putting it amongst a handful of mainly European countries to set aside cash specifically. I've got to be honest with you. $20 million would be probably spent on toilet paper um, for the Ministry of Education in a year. I mean, it's chicken feed, really, isn't it? I mean, why is it just some sort of symbolic act? Um... I'm not familiar with the particular de details of that, but look, it is a huge problem, and that does sound like a, re a really modest amount. <laughs> modest, God. And, uh, but the thing is, we, by international standards, I think many New Zealanders would say that our contribution to climate change, is given the size of our minimal. population, yeah, and yeah. our... Yeah. 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 Having said that, we have a huge stake, in a country which depends 
on agriculture for its well-being and prosperity, mm. our agricultural exports, we have a huge stake in a reasonably stable climate. I think no country will be exempt from increasingly the symptoms of extreme weather, I including get, our own. I get so, the feeling, yeah. though, that the Climate Change Minister, James Shaw, co-leader, of course, of the Green Party as well, is in Egypt getting, well, about to leave, I think, actually, getting very, very frustrated that nothing's going to happen in good consequence because, A, of the world's geopolitical situation, but B, because of the world's economic situation, particularly in the West, where the cost of living is starting to build and buy upon um, domestic economies and domestic consumers. Yeah. So you're not particularly interested in climate change just now because I'm more interested in the price of gas, ironically, um, and, um, and, yeah. and the price of food. Well, I think that's fair comment. And, and the other thing is that the conflict we were just referring to, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, has been disastrous. Mm -hmm. uh, for the environment and climate change. I mean, according to President Zelensky, the Russian invasion has led to the destruction of huge amounts of forest in the Ukraine. Ukraine's a big country. And um, so that's got long-term effects that we're going to have to deal with. And, um, you know, many countries behave as if war is not a problem when it comes to the impact that it has in the environment. But all the evidence suggests otherwise. So, yes, I mean, it, it, there is a mismatch between the looming but uh, in except, uh, you know uh, looming but steady emergence of climate change and the, the ability of to build the political consensus globally to deal with it this is a global problem it doesn't recognize boundaries but at the moment we're struggling to get this consensus we need to deal with and therein lies the challenge i would suggest to you for new zealand politicians because they're going to have to convince an increasingly doubting new zealand population that when all those other Western countries aren't doing anything because they are consumed by domestic issues at home and the big polluters like Russia and India and um, uh, China mm. uh, are sort of absenting themselves from the new forum, why New Zealanders should be suddenly making these significant sacrifices when none of those huge countries are? Yeah? Well, that is a test of leadership, isn't it? And uh, it's also, New Zealand can't do it on its own, no. but it can build up um, constituencies or contribute to uh, groups or alignments which do take a similar view. No, I understand um, that. I understand the, one that. of the biggest problems... Yeah. yeah. One of the biggest problems, though, Michael, I think, is that the UN Security Council is not fit for purpose. And that is, you have five countries which can block anything they don't like. Uh, the permanent members of the Security Council, which means, actually, we don't actually have the mechanisms for putting together coherent global policies that deal with issues which don't respect borders because someone always objects to it mm. um and it might be the united states it might be russia it might be china someone always says oh no we can't we can't tackle this climate change because it's going to disadvantage our country well actually the biggest disadvantage for everyone will be we don't tackle it but it's very difficult as you quite rightly indicate to get to a point where people can agree that they may have to make some sacrifices in order to achieve, uh, you know, a greater benefit for everyone, which is actually confronting this problem. Um, I read somewhere, but, I mean, I only read it, I think it was in the Times, that China could be the saviour in the sense that it might get to the new technology quicker than anybody else. In other words, the new technology that isn't reliant upon fossil fuels and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, is that realistic or is that just a pipe dream that China's going to save the world from climatic change? I think that's probably a bit of a simplification because China has, is reinvesting in more coal. It wants to keep up its economic growth. It's had terrible problems resulting from smog and other atmospheric emissions. Mm. Uh, it's certainly, you're quite right, it's certainly investing impressive, impressively now in technology designed to counter that. But it's a huge country, a 1.5 billion, and I think China may set an example, perhaps, but I don't think China can fix the problem for anyone, uh, perhaps even themselves, because this is a, I mean, this is one of the things that many politicians get have problems getting their head around. They see the world in compartmentalized terms based on national interest, and they can't really conceive of a problem which affects everyone and can devastate, you know, everything we've worked for. 
um, they see it in national terms. And this is a this is a real challenge that we face in the the next decade: is how do we really come up with a policy that is commensurate with the scale of the problem? All right. And finally, um, local politics. So, I mean, I know your international politics credentials are superb, but yeah, you're. <laughs> but I'm just no, um, thank you. But I, I, don't, I don't think I can help you on global um, well, local. Well, I was just going to yeah. translate all this because um, you teach political science or political studies at Otago University, yes? Yeah, I teach international relations. That's I teach my international area. relations. Um, I did political yeah. studies. Uh, Jim Flynn, I think, was the head of it when I was there. So. Um, yes, Jim passed away just a few years ago. Yes, he did. Uh, former leader of the Alliance. He was a, he was a real solid lefty. But um, uh, gosh, I remember going to his first oh, one, yeah. political philosophy. Yeah, lecture. I mean, whatever your yeah, whatever your political leanings, putting that to one side, he was an extremely decent human being yes, and also yeah. a, a great academic. He was a, a, an academics academic. He was dedicated. He certainly was. And he came up with the Flynn effect and IQ and tests and all those sorts of things. He did. Uh, which is brilliant, legacy, brilliant man. Which is ironic in actual fact because it was the right <laughs> who used the Flynn effect for political effect, wasn't it? He must have hated that. Uh, I think he relished it because Jim was Jim was a, a wonderful person because he always had that breadth of generosity. Some of his best friends passionately dis- disagreed with him Mm. on that issue Mm. and so he was quite friendly with people who spent a lot of their time attacking his views Mm. and he never took it personally he was he he believed that the ideas should not be you know intellectual debate should not become personal or abusive and And he he lived his life that way and he also believed very strongly and passionately in free speech um that you make good decisions based upon that kind of exchange robert he did, and he was a wonderful man, and he had a big effect on my career when I started at Targo. And, uh, yeah, I, I can't say anything but good, Jim, about, good things about Jim. He was a wonderful human being and a decent man who tried in his own way to contribute to public education and inspire people to move forward, whatever political direction they were going in, trying to give them the tools to do the job. Good on you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Pat. It was lovely always to talk to you. You have Thank a very you. good day. Nice to talk to you and get that insight. Uh, it's Professor Robert Patman, as you know, the uh, Head of International Relations at uh, the Political Studies Department of Otago University. I, I had him on the show today for a very simple reason. I hope you learned something from that or at least got some insight. You might have known it all anyhow, but I just wanted to get some sort of sense of the two major international events of this world and how they're going. And I hadn't thought of that before. The one thing that he that I took out of that interview was the idea of New Zealand being a trading nation. We are. If we don't trade, um, and I think all of us understand that, if we don't trade with the rest of the world, we don't make a money, we don't have an economy. He emphasised again, and I think this will um, be very, um, you know, go down well in rural and provincial centres in New Zealand, he and listeners, um, how dependent New Zealand was upon our wealth uh, particularly for our ag- agricultural exports, which have built this country's economy and which continue to maintain it. Uh, but he, th- the interesting thing was he then put that in an international context and said, well, so therefore we need a rules-based order. You know, we need to know that as a small country we can go and that the rules tomorrow will be the same and no matter if we're dealing with China or we're dealing with the European community or we're trading with, oh, I don't know, India or Afghanistan, um, probably not so much the latter, we there will still be the rules followed that might won't be right that if they do something wrong like for example canada stiffed us despite having a free trade agreement we can go somewhere and get justice um, and know that tomorrow the same rules will apply which allows us then to sell um, on an international stage and not be disadvantaged and it's a point i think he well made um, and i thank him for that